Okay. Marconi in Newfoundland. 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 <laughs> I don't know where that's going to go. Wait. In your pocket. Sparks. No, no, it's not, it's not going to go there. No, it's not. It's because. You'll see why. Clip it on your finger. You want to hold it? Hold it. days but we're going to talk we're going to talk about this so by 1901 uh, he had done his work in New Jersey and other places and demonstrated ship to shore communications and in fact he even started had started a business called the uh, MAM, MAMCC as you can see what that is for ship to shore which was really Marconi company's big business um, his main company was called the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company, and he was looking for new opportunities. But uh, he was under pressure from his board of directors. Now, nobody's ever had that happen before, uh, but uh, he was. So he proposed what he called the great thing, which was transatlantic <laughs> communications. Never been done before, uh, transatlantic radio uh, telegraph communications, and he proposed to do it. So some of his staffing was kind of, that, that he hired was kind of interesting. His uh, consultant was uh, John Ambrose Fleming, whom you may know uh, as the inventor of the uh, uh, vacuum diode. And um, Fleming was hired at 500 pounds a year as a consultant. Marconi's uh, pay was 500, dollars, uh, 500 pounds a year as well, um, but he did it. Uh, the engineer was some, uh, a good person called Richard Vivian. His chief assistant was George Kemp. These are people you're going to hear about later. Uh, he selected the sites that he was going to use for this transatlantic attempt, the great thing. Uh, a place called Poldew in Cornwall, which is near Penzance, which if you know is kind of the southwestern end of England, and South Wellfleet on Cape Cod. So I want to talk to you about the scale of this thing. Uh, there are some lines representing the distance from uh, Poldew to uh, South uh, Wellfleet, which is the blue line. And just to show the difference, the, the red line is from that area to Belmar, which is where our museum is. Uh, however, the world's distance record for radio telegraph had been 225 miles, or eventually was 225 miles, uh, between uh, Cork and Poldew, which is Poldew and Cork up here. Uh, and he proposed, uh, there's, there's the Belmar distance, he proposed uh, a 3,000 mile stretch to Wellfleet. Um, it was kind of a uh, stretch, let's say. Now here are the antennas that they intended to use, in fact they built. Uh, at Poldew, they built a, uh, an antenna which consisted of 20, 20 200 foot tall uh, towers uh, in a circle uh, in a 200-foot diameter with a um, 
400 wires coming off of the, of the stringers between those towers uh, to, a, to make a big cone antenna. Um, the only stays were radial stays outward and stays between the, the 20 um, uh, uh, towers, and uh, that would have some consequences. Uh, his, by the way, his engineer thought it was a terrible design, uh, wouldn't sign off on it, but they built the, essentially the same thing at Wellfleet. However, uh, in S September of 1901, before the experiment, Poldew got blown down. Uh, what a surprise. So he began considering some other plans. Uh, he, he constructed a simpler antenna at Poldew, and, which required lower power and so on. So he looked for a closer North American site because Poldew was gone. So he chose Newfoundland, St. John's Newfoundland. Why? Well, you can see here. Uh, there's Wellfleet. Uh, there is Signal Hill, St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, 2,000 miles. Still quite a distance, but uh, considerably better than the other. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they scheduled the experiment for December of that year, 1901. And by the way, the South Wellfleet antenna got blown down as well. Uh, it's a good thing that they had made some cho other choices. OK, now we go into a, a little intermission here. Uh, I'll give you a little travelogue on Newfoundland and Signal Hill. This is Newfoundland. Newfoundland, uh, as you can see, is, and you saw in the previous things, is kind of sticking out in the ocean. Um, this is Newfoundland. The part we're most interested in is, is over here. Uh, here it is enlarged, and here are some places that we're going to be talking about. Uh, Hearts Content, Newfoundland, St. John's, Newfoundland, Cape Spear, Newfoundland, Fairyland, and Gander. Uh, we'll be talking about those as we go along. So the first thing is welcome to Newfoundland. Newfoundland was not part of Canada in 1901. In fact, uh, that little asterisk uh, is to remind me to talk later about the fact that this Marconi situation, which we'll get into, um, actually delayed the, the fact that Newfoundland was going to join Canada in the early part of the century. They did not. They finally joined in 1949. Uh, we'll find out why. Landfall for the transatlantic telegraph cables had been placed in Hearts Content. There were three telegraph cables owned by the uh, Anglo-American uh, Telegraph Company, sorry, uh, which later was bought out by Western Union. Uh, so here's a shot of the uh, Great Eastern, which was the cable ship that laid the transatlantic cable in 1866, uh, in Hearts Content. Uh, Newfoundland was also the site of a historic meeting between uh, Churchill and Roosevelt in 1941 before the U.S. entered the Second World War. Churchill wanted the U.S. to do it. Uh, the U.S. would not do it at that time. Three months later, the Japanese um, helped us to become involved. But anyway, this was the first time that these leaders met and uh, it was very successful. And finally, during World War II, Gander, Newfoundland, which I uh, showed you, which was on the upper part of the part of Newfoundland, uh, happened to be the world's busiest airport because they were ferrying airplanes from North America to Europe, uh, to England, uh, day and night for, for four years. Yes? It was a colony. It was Britain's oldest colony in 1901. Uh, it became, uh, I forget what they called it, but it wasn't part of Canada in 1907, but it became, uh, it got some other status and became part of Canada in 1949. By vote of the people of 51% to 49%, by the way. Uh, 
So anyway, typically, what does Newfoundland look like? Well, here are some typical scenes. Uh, here is Kitty Vitty. Uh, Kitty Vitty is just below Signal Hill. Uh, there's a regatta there every August. Uh, very, that's the way they say it. Uh, uh, very nice event. Uh, anyway, uh, here is a nice beach. See, see the rock. See the well. You don't walk there. <laughs> you can see. The, you can see the rock. And here's last April. Here's what uh, Fairyland, which is a place that I showed you, which was a little bit down the coast, looked like. Uh, that's about a 40 foot out of the water iceberg. They float by. Uh, and that's what they. That's what they look like. I did not take that picture. I wasn't there in April. I was there in July. Um, there were lots of these guys. I took lots and lots of pictures of these guys. Uh, up to 100 feet long, nice flippers, um, swimming pods. And by the way, if you're in a boat, which I was at one point, um, uh, you've heard fish breath described. Well, it's worse. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> and here's Signal Hill. Signal Hill is, this is Signal Hill here. This is the St. John's Harbor. Uh, this is called the Narrows. And that's the South, uh, sorry, the North Atlantic out there and England's on the other side. So um, it's exposed, it's right up there. This is Cape Spear. Cape Spear is the closest spot in North America to Europe. Um, it's about, 10 miles closer than, uh, than Signal Hill, but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. That's, that's sort of behind this, this promontory here. Um, this is a shot I took. There's a large uh, museum right here. Uh, and this is a shot I took of that showing Cabot Tower on top of Signal Hill. This is Cabot Tower. And here's a sign you may find that uh, points out that uh, Paul Dew is 2155 miles from here. It's, that's actually 2140 miles from Cape Spear. But anyway, um, so Signal Hill. Here's a little background on that. As far back as the 1600s, uh, Signal Hill was used to hoist flag signals. That was why it was called originally the Lookout. So the people in, in the town, which was down here, could see uh, warnings of um, things coming in from the ocean. Um, in 1762, during the Seven Years' War, which we here in the US call the French and Indian War, um, it was renamed Signal Hill. And the last battle of, um, uh, in, in, in the north took place there uh, in 1762. And, um, and then there was Cabot Tower. Cabot Tower, which looks like this, and is you can just see it on top of Signal Hill there, uh, was constructed at the end of the 19, uh, end of the 1800s um, for the 400th anniversary of Giovanni Caboto's landing on the coast in, 19, in 1497. So Cabot landed here, um, and you know. Many years later, 400 years later, they built a tower in his name. So uh, now let's get back to the action. Now Marconi and his assistant uh, arrived in St. John's for the great experiment, for the, uh, the, the, the great thing, on December 6th of 1901. And um, he set up his operations in an abandoned diphtheria hospital, which is no longer there. Um, near Cabot Tower, up on Signal Hill. And um, the antennas that both Poldew and Wellfleet having been broken down, here are the antennas that were used. At Poldew, they, re, re, they put up two masts with a stringer between and 54 wires and a fan antenna. And that's a thing that has been analyzed for performance, and we'll talk about that later. So that was the transmitter at Poldew. Uh, the receiving site, and there's the diphtheria hospital, um, they took kites and balloons to pull wires up into the air as the antenna. Uh, 
it was too windy to use the balloons, so they ended up just using kites. But those were, that was the receiving antenna. So here's Marconi's equipment. There was a two-stage spark transmitter. Uh, basically, he couldn't get enough juice to drive uh, roughly 30 kilowatts on this spark transmitter, so it was two-stage. Uh, basically, it drove drove a, a, a lower vo lower voltage uh, uh, spark here, and that spark through this transformer drove this spark, which eventually charged the capacitor, and. Uh, provided uh, signals of um, you know, th 30 kilowatts or thereabouts. Um, remember, this was a much more limited version than his original plan. Uh, because it took a long time to charge up the cap, uh, basically the spark rate was very low. Uh, and what that resulted in uh, we'll talk about in a minute. What frequency did this thing operate on? Well, lots of people have analyzed that. Um, things weren't very precise in those days, but the transmitter frequency was estimated to be between 500 and 935 kilohertz, so the AM broadcast band. Um, most people think it was about 855. Um, so, um, the AM broadcast band, what could go wrong? OK. On the receiving side, connected to his kite through a 500-foot piece of wire, which served as his receiving antenna, which, by the way, kept getting blown down, uh, he ended up using a non-syntonic receiver. What is syntonic? Well, syntonic is essentially uh, tunable. Uh, that was a word that was used. Uh, the dictionary defines it as a matching of frequencies. Um, <coughs> why he did that was because, well, because he couldn't uh, get his antennas stable enough to really tune, tune the receiver, so he had to forego a tunable receiver and basically use an untuned receiver. Uh, the receiver was based on a coherer. Uh, I assume people basically know what a coherer is. A coherer is a device that, um, in this case, he used carbon granules. Um, uh, when, when a current passes through, the carbon granules line up and uh, you, you carries current, and then you tap it and it breaks it up, and uh, there, there's a tapper that taps the thing and keeps tapping it. Um, since uh, he was going to receive very weak signals, being 2,000 miles from the transmitter. Um, he put a, a, a Bell headphone uh, to his ear, rather than having the thing that they normally would have used, which was an inker, a Morse inker. Uh, normally, with a strong signal, you'd use a Morse inker, and it would put, it on, put the marks on paper. Uh, they thought it wouldn't be strong enough, so it was audio only. So Marconi and his assistant were listening for clicks. Um, now, it was a pretty low spark rate, as we said, one, uh, two to three sparks per second. So really, if you heard anything, you didn't hear. For example, if you go down to our museum and you listen to Al's uh, spark transmitter, you'll hear a buzz. Uh, here, basically, you'd hear a click, one click. Uh, so it was a pretty primitive system, receiver system. <coughs> so the tests were started. On December 11th, uh, they sent up a balloon, and uh, he connected his um, syntonic, his tunable receiver, to that. Uh, couldn't tune it, but pretty soon the balloon got blown away because there was a gale blowing. Uh, they gave up for that day. Came out the next day with a kite, uh, and the way they operated was this. Poldu was told to send the letter S, three dots, continuously from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. each day of testing in Poldu. 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., that translates to 11.30 in the morning to 2.30 in the afternoon in Newfoundland. 
Excuse me? His finger must have been tired. Well, presumably it wasn't a finger, but <laughs> anyway. And then, by the way, sunset at Poldu was uh, 4.20 p.m. Uh, on December 12th, uh, which meant it was before 1 in the afternoon in Newfoundland. Uh, Charles was just mentioning to me the difference between, you know, sun, sun up in one location and sun, sun not available in another location. So, uh, for most of the time, the path was partly in darkness. Uh, and on December 12th, Marconi wrote in his notes, and uh, his assistant verified, uh, that he heard dots at 12.30, at 1.10, and at 2.20, uh, Newfoundland time. Um, so on the next day, December 13th, uh, they heard them once again. Uh, and uh, he, he happened to be in town down in St. John's on the 14th, and uh, people heard about it. Uh, and he received congratulations from Edison, who happened to be... Um, to have had a meeting with Marconi beforehand, uh, had apparently liked him. And by the way, Edison did not like uh, Tesla, who was a Marconi um, competitor. Uh, so who knows? Uh, he also received uh, congratulations from Michael Poupin up at um, uh, Columbia, I guess it was, right? And from uh, Dolbert and from some others. Uh, that close to the winter solstice, that far north, sunspots would have absorbed all uh, the There was some discussion about that in some of the yeah, reviews I've read. Was very little sunspot absorption. Uh, and anyway, on December 16th, uh, which was a Monday, he began scouting for a permanent site, and he looked at Cape Spear, which I showed you sticking out in the ocean there, which was the closest point to England. And... Um, on that day, he got a letter from the Anglo-American Telegraph Company, who were often hearts, hearts content there, uh, threatening to uh, sue the pants off him if he, because they had the monopoly on telegraphy in Newfoundland. Now, it didn't say wireless telegraphy, it just said telegraphy. Uh, so there was some contention about whether uh, they would actually have a leg to stand on. But... Um, Marconi didn't really want a lawsuit, so uh, he, had, he happened to be having lunch with an official from the Canadian, uh, tel uh, Canadian post office. Remember, Canada is separate from Newf Newfoundland. And uh, he mentioned, by the way, why don't you come to Canada? Marconi thought that was a great idea, so he crossed over to Nova Scotia, and by the next year, uh, he built a uh, wireless station at Glace Bay. Uh, which he, in Nova Scotia, which was in Canada, and operated that for, for years. Um, now, when the um, Anglo-American um, uh, monopoly expired, uh, Mar the Marconi Company came back, but oddly enough, never did transatlantic communication, they, but they did provide lots of ship-to-shore stations for Newfoundland, which, again, was still separate, but uh, now they were able to do this. Uh, here's an example. In Cabot Tower, uh, there was a Marconi station for many, many years, and in the 30s, this is what it looked like. Um, you can see the modern equipment that they were using at the time. Uh, I, to tell the truth, I really don't know what all the equipment is, but... Even by 30s standards, that's right. And by the way, in the mid-30s, they replaced all of their stations. <laughs> so that, that, this, it was on its last legs uh, by this time. Um, so anyway, Marconi had been there. He had been in Newfoundland for 19 days. Uh, he had made four observations that he claimed had been receptions of the signals from Polju. Um, people tended to believe him, or at least believe that he thought he had. Uh, but there are a lot of questions. In fact, this is something that um, radio people really are uh, more concerned with here, I think. 
Uh, first was the time of day. Uh, part of the path was always in daylight. It never got dark across that path. And the wavelength, uh, or the, the frequency, it was actually in the broadcast band. So did he really hear signals during the day in the broadcast band from 2,000 miles away? There are, there's some uh, discussion about whether, in fact, uh, he wasn't hearing um, 855, which was the frequency that um, most people think that it was, but he was hearing harmonics. Um, you know, 855, uh, so that's, uh, you know, the second harmonic's 3.8, and, you know, 7.6 would be, you know, and so on. So uh, it could have been on other frequencies. There have been some analyses of that. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in a few minutes. Um, and by the way, Belmar, when it operated, was at 21 kilohertz. <coughs> excuse me, at 21 kilohertz, not 800 kilohertz. Uh, everybody went down to the low band for transatlantic communication for a long time. His receiver was pretty in, un, uh, insensitive. Uh, he was using a coherer. Uh, and of course, it wasn't selective at all because it wasn't the the one that he actually used wasn't a tuned receiver. It was just basically wide open. Uh, as somebody pointed out, even if um, you know this had all been successful, you could transmit you know one station across the ocean at a time. Um, there was no amplification. The vacuum tube hadn't been developed yet. In fact, as I pointed out, Fleming was actually his consultant, and Fleming hadn't even invented the, uh, the diode yet. So um, there was no amplification. Uh, and of course, he and his assistant were both suffering from fatigue, listening every day to three hours of continuous static and noise and so on, trying to pick out a signal. So did they really hear it? Maybe. So there have been some attempts at verifications. Uh, Marconi um, himself took a uh, cruise, cruise, a trip across the ocean again in February of 1902, coming from Europe to the US, uh, on the SS Philadelphia. Uh, he uh, used a, in, a, in a, another test, uh, he used the transmitted signals from Poldu, but he used a syntonic receiver, the tunable receiver, with a Morse inker uh, and a uh, uh, four-wire antenna, long-wire long antenna, 200, uh, sorry, 150 feet off the deck of the ship. And the ship, of course, had a very good ground system, being in the ocean. Um, and he was successful. The Morse inker showed that he actually received, received signals. Uh, a little hard to, to argue with that. Uh, and it was similar to the distance and so on. And some of it was, in fact, it was largely at night, though. The daytime was much shorter. The mileage was shorter. So um, it kind of gets at a couple of the questions that were asked, you know, what time of day and, um, uh, you know, how good was the receiver and so on. But... Uh, he did demonstrate transmission from Poldu to the, the Philadelphia uh, over 2,000 miles, uh, a couple of months after his uh, Signal Hill expo exploit. Now, one person who has done a lot of studies of this is a fellow from the Communications Research Center of Canada, a fellow named John Belrose. Um, and... Um, he analyzed the technical details of the transmitter and the receiver, and he said, essentially, it's highly unlikely he could have transmitted harmonics uh, higher than uh, you know the, broad the broadcast band. Um, it, it kind of cut off at, at about a megahertz. The, transmit the antenna system cut off at about a megahertz and didn't have any harmonics above that in his analysis. So that kind of 
speaks against one of the arguments. Uh, also, the Signal Hill receiver uh, would have uh, had to have been a lot more sensitive, according to uh, Belrose's analysis, than it was. Uh, sorry, than the one, yeah, than the syntonic one on the ship. So um, it's a question of whether, in fact, he did hear anything. And by the way, later successful uh, exploits, uh, one on an Italian um, uh, ship and uh, the later to Glace Bay and places like that were at much lower frequencies. The, the next experiment was at 272 kilohertz and they went down to, as I said, 21 kilohertz at Belmar. So uh, they were using longer and longer wavelengths. Um, lots more ground wave, um, not, not counting on um, uh, you know, daytime, nighttime, and, um, and, the, and the, the ionosphere. Right. So, did he do it? Well, there have been some beacon tests by a radio amateur in uh, Poldu, actually. Uh, GB3 SSS with a 100 watt beacon uh, to people in uh, Newfoundland. These were done in late 2006. And at roughly the same time of day, uh, they were successful. Of course, this was in 160 meters. This was a ham band, um, which 1.8 megahertz is at least double what um, Marconi claimed. Uh, so, yeah, this worked. But what kind of receivers did these hams use? Uh, what kind of antenna system did they use? Probably not as primitive as, Mar as Marconi's. So, and then there have been many other analyses of this. So, did he succeed? I mean, that's the ultimate question. And, um, well, I don't know. I'm, it, whether he succeeded technically, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical. Uh, but, Belrose did write this. Whether he heard faint dots or not is kind of unimportant now. He started the business. He started people going after this problem and uh, they got there. And uh, if it hadn't been for Marconi going out and starting this whole thing, um, you know, it might have been a lot, lo lot later when people actually did it. So even though Belrose is a skeptic on the technical side, he thinks it was a good thing. Uh, so that's really it. That's all I have to say. Thanks from NJ Arc and RTM and, and from Newfoundland. And uh, I can tell you about Newfoundland. <laughs> what is your relationship to Newfoundland? <laughs> I want to go back. <laughs> My daughter-in-law is a, uh, a native of St. John's. And uh, she took us up there for a week and a half. And she went to visit her mother. And then she went to, you know, took, we rented a house and stayed there for a week and a, week and a half or so. Great place. Lovely place. Great place. In July. <laughs> now, <coughs> you, you, you saw what it was like in April. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it like in September there? I wasn't there in September, so I can't tell you. <laughs> I, I can tell you that in, in, in December, according to Marconi's notes, uh, there were almost constant gales on Signal Hill. And I can also tell you that I was on Signal Hill on a beautiful July day. Oh, you saw how sunny it was and how nice it was. And we were on the third floor of the, mark of the um, let me go back to that, in fact. Uh, OK. We were on the third floor of the, yeah, Cabot Tower, which I'll give you in a second. Um, third floor of Cabot Tower here. There's a balcony out here. And uh, it took two people to open the door to get out there. The wind was... And that's on the landward side. This is on the landward side. The seaward side is over here. Uh, and that was in July. So I can imagine what it's like. I imagine no one swims there. <laughs> I didn't see anybody swimming. No, I didn't. <laughs> a lot of... 
Fly from Newark, uh, well we flew from Newark to Toronto and Toronto up, or you can fly from uh, uh, Newark to um, Ottawa or and Ottawa up. Is or, there still a direct flight out of Newark to I, uh, Not that I know of, not, not a convenient one. Not a convenient one. Uh, no, 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 beautiful, oh, you, you mean direct, direct flight. I'm trying to remember, three, two to three hours, something like that. <laughs> no, that's Gander. That was Gander. Uh, let's see. Did I give you the? Yeah, I gave you the. I gave you the map, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Gander. Gander is uh, Gander is up here. And by the way, uh, the place. Oh, so here's Fairyland. This is where the uh, the iceberg was uh, last April. So. It was a colony. It was Britain's oldest colony in 1901. The longest. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, let's see. As I said, 19, 1949 they joined, and um, there's Hearts Content. Now, how'd you get names like that, by the way? Uh, the city, the, the the towns up and down the coast on that side of the coast are named. Uh, it's it's an inland. You know, it's on a on a bay on a uh, an arm of the ocean. Uh, our heart's desire, heart's content, and um, I forget, heart's something, the other one. So I don't know who named them, but anyway. Um, yeah, Bruce Ingraham pointed this, me, me to this, to, to heart's content. Uh, and, but it became very important. Oh, and, and I, I think I did mention the reason that, um, the reason that this uh, star is here is that after Marconi left Newfoundland and went to Canada, he so pissed off the Prime Minister of Newfoundland that he basically refused to consider becoming a Commonwealth in 1906 or whenever they were going to. Uh, and uh, it was put off for another 40 years. So. Way to hold a grudge. Huh? No, way to hold a grudge. Uh, What's, is your uh, in-law family, will they go back to fishing? Was it it's, uh, still a fishing? There's still oh there's still a lot of fishing out there. Mostly it's taking tourists out to watch the whales though. Yeah. Uh, there are whale boats all over the of course there are whales all over the place too. I mean on any day well first of all we were there for I don't know eight days or something. Every single day we saw whales, lots of whales. Um, you could go out and take pictures of the things. Uh, you know, we, something tells me they have no growing season. <laughs> Uh, they grow root vegetables, I think. Uh, uh, yeah. What was the image? Can you go back a couple of slides back? The aircraft. Oh, oh, oh. The, 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 How did they get that aircraft up there? Fly them up there. It was World War II. Yeah, yeah. Fly, let, let me see. Uh, yeah, if I do this. Oh, no, that's too far. Wait. One second. Yep, I'm, I'm working on it here. Ah, come on. Look at the there. Oh, there we go. There we go. Large airfield left in uh, North America yeah. before you get to, so was, it's the closest to get to Europe. It's the close as I pointed out, Newfoundland is the closest thing to north to, from between North America and Europe. And uh, where is Greenland in relation to Newfoundland? Well, Greenland isn't part of North America. It's it's further west. <laughs> or east, I mean, further east. Because it was also a major place there. Yes, but this was this was on the mainland. And, and it was used on 9/11. 9/11, right? What was it? It was used on 9/11. All the planes that could not fly back from from Europe to the U.S. landed at Gander, and they were welcomed into people's homes. And uh, they, I'm sorry. Yes, called um, um, what's it called? Um, come from away, right? Because that's a Newfoundland expression, people come from away. Uh, there's some interesting expressions like regatta, or come from away, or, or um, outports. Everything except St. John's is an outport. Um, yes? If they had gone with the original Cape Cod, oh, do, you wealthy? Think it, do you think it would have reached? Or? Uh, let's put it this way. Are we sure it reached the Newfoundland? And then Cape Cod was almost 1,000 miles further. Uh, 
Yes. Did you say they still have the daunting cars up there, the horse drawn two wheel cars? I didn't really notice that. The sixties and early seventies are still there. Like they haven't used them in Ireland. Well there is there's well, there's a very strong Irish um, background to this area. In fact, uh, the let me go back a little further. Yeah, um, this uh, the, the 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 road around here is called the Irish Loop, from St. John's down around and back. Um, and uh, I didn't notice them, but they may still be there. <laughs> we took that drive. Uh, they may still be. But anyway, uh, any other questions? Anything else I can say? Other than visit. It's a lot of fun mm -hmm. in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody sees icebergs that often, so that was pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I missed those. Uh, <laughs> let's see, where are they? Oh, uh, it was excellent, actually. A uh, fair amount of seafood. Um, Kitty Vitti is a nice uh, little little town. It's like a suburb uh, of St. John's. It's um, let's see if I can get these maps right. Right, if Kitty Vitti is this is Signal Hill. Uh, this is downtown St. John's here. Kitty Vitti is just the other side of this uh, of Signal Hill here, um, and uh, they have some nice restaurants there. It's a very uh, scenic uh, place. Uh, very nice place. So you figure their income is uh, tourism? Uh, no, a lot of the income still is fishing. There's still a lot of fishing, but um, the in a lot of the income is also tourism. Yeah. How many people are there? I or don't there? know. It's a, it's a pretty good city. It's a good good sized city. Um, uh, I'm I, I'm afraid I don't know the number though. Sorry. Oh, they don't whale there. No, no. They're, 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 that's probably why the whales are there. They're safe. <laughs> they just have they just have boats going around bothering them, you know. So they so all they do is they blow off, and you just say, "Oh God, we get out of here." <laughs> uh, yeah, that they don't do, they, they haven't done whaling there in a long time. <laughs> no, the, the cod is still uh, they still fish cod off the banks and things like that. Um, but uh, a lot, you know, a lot of it is gone. I'm sure. Uh, okay. okay. Any other questions? That's it. Mm -hmm. At one time, <clears throat> probably 10, 15 years ago, I have picked up four Chicago stations in Williamsburg, Virginia, between two and three in the afternoon, which would be one o'clock Chicago time. Whoa. And it happened to me on two occasions that I know. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, but they're 50 kilowatt stations. They're 50 kilowatt stations, but it's almost noon in Chicago, and it's 2 o'clock in Virginia. The sunset is three hours away. That's so true. It was the early December like that. So if hmm. you bring that up to Newfoundland, Newfoundland. it's almost like the same thing as being in the dark. You know, from, from a, you know, oh, yeah. Skip standpoint. So no. You, you uh, have to get lucky, though. Oh, you, you definitely have to get lucky, but but as I say, these were the relative times. So, um, you know, to, from from 12:50 p.m. in in Newfoundland, it was dark in Pol getting dark in Poldhu. So, part of the part of the path was in darkness, but it needs to be dark at the receiving end. Yeah, well, it it wasn't, as you can see, uh, they were transmitting till 2:30 uh, p.m. Newfoundland time. So it was not dark in Newfoundland. It needs to be dark at the receiving end. Mm -hmm. Transmitting end, not so much. Okay. Did you have a half hour's worth of jet lag when you got there? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's an hour and a half. An hour it's an hour and a half from did, here. Did, did Marconi have to deal with that, or did that come in later? <laughs> <laughs> did, did it, seriously, did, yeah. does it create a problem trying to coordinate schedules like between here and, and there? Yeah, the half hour messes you up. I mean, you're used to an hour between here and there, but between, uh, you know, the half hour really screws it up. <laughs> okay, Harry, thank you. Thank you. Hey, don't forget your shirt. Oh, yes. Here, let me shut this down.
right. Um, I, I, just, I left out something. I want to be remiss in uh, a repair clinic. I forgot to mention. I forgot to mention that uh, former President uh, Phil, uh, after lunch, happened to bring a troop of fellows who wanted some education in electronic antique radio electronic restoration 101, and he held a little class uh, off-site mm -hmm. in, in the uh, in the back of the um, RTM. And uh, I know a bunch of guys went, and it was, it was very productive, and they, they appreciated that. And again, you know, we've got to share our information. We've got to share what we know and pass it on to the people that don't know, and hopefully the younger people, too. Yes, he Bruce? Left, he left a collection of flip charts that are excellent. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. He's a that's photographed all of them, preserved them, because they're really old-time stand but full powerful. Well, that's and the kind of guy Phil is. He's efficient. OK, um, we have. Um, April 13th meeting is at InfoAge and it's hints and kinks. I want to see everybody next Saturday at our repair, at our, um, our spring swap meet and or vending, buying, whatever. I just want to see everybody. Please come out and uh, support your club, okay? And speaking of that, we now have a, a little mini auction, so let's partake of that. So thanks for coming. See you soon. <laughs> I didn't forget. Oh, oh sorry. So Dave, we don't believe you. <laughs>